Hi, welcome to today's video. My name is Paul. So this week's video, as well as obviously being a YouTube video, um, it's also a Patreon video in the sense that I released the video a few days early on Patreon. I also included some notes um, in the Patreon version. Uh, the notes just went into more detail about what I'm going to be talking about in this video and also some more sort of technical stuff about the painting itself composition and use of color and things like that and i'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who supports me uh, on patreon and kofi uh, it really does make a difference i've been able to buy more watercolor paper for example uh, because of your support um, so as i say it really does make a difference and, and thank you for for helping out with that this video itself um, would also be a little bit longer than most of my videos. Um, ho hopefully my voice won't give out halfway, but we'll try. Um, so the reason I wanted to make it longer was I would just want to, usually I, I, I edit out quite a bit from the painting process. There are some people who like to put up um, speeded up versions of the painting process. I, I don't like those. First of all, I don't like looking at them because uh, they make me feel physically ill. I don't know, it's just something about the images flashing by very quickly. I know on YouTube you can slow things down, but it still looks a bit weird to me. Um, so usually rather than doing that, I will edit the video. Uh, but this one, I've tried to just sort of step back and just show you pretty much the whole process from the blank piece of paper right through to the finished painting. Now, having said that, I did have some technical issues at the end. So there's about a minute or so at the very end of the, the painting process um, where the, the camera ran out of um, power, the battery died. Um, but I did scan the painting, so you will see the final version. And it's only a minute or so that was lost. So. The painting itself, um, kind of in two stages, I guess. So this first stage included painting the sky and also putting in the main compositional elements of the painting, sort of like the backbones, the bone structure, if you like, of the, the painting. And this is all done in blue, uh, a few different blues, but everything is in blue. And then the second stage is starting to add color to the painting. Now, when I say add color, it's basically just one more color, sort of cadmium yellow, um, where the yellow and the blue meet and there's still a bit of dampness in the paper. You'll get greens forming, but basically it's, it's just adding yellow. Other things I can say is, again, there's no reference. Um, it's all just imagination and memory start with the sky and the way I paint the sky is I guess a bit weird as well I leave some of the white paper showing through but to me those aren't white clouds that's the blue sky and the blue bits that I put on that's the clouds the white clouds I know it doesn't make any sense but it's it's again I don't use as I mentioned in a video before I don't use local color so I don't think of the sky as blue and the clouds as white and the grass as green. I really don't do that. I use color the way I want to use color for aesthetic reasons more than anything else. So it's the same even painting hedges like this. Um, hedges aren't blue, of course, but that's the way I paint them. I would always encourage people who are sort of getting started with, whether it's watercolor or any other um, medium, don't think that you have to do things the way most people think they have to be done, if that makes sense. Um, as an artist, you can push the boundaries, you can do things differently. At the end of the day, this is still a landscape and it'll still be recognizable as a landscape, but the way I've used color is completely not the usual way of doing it. 
And as an artist, you're allowed to do things like that. So one of the things that sort of, one of the reasons why I developed this style of painting was due to an influence um, from a type of Japanese art that I sort of want to talk about in this video. This style of Japanese art didn't just influence me. Uh, back in the 19th century, it was a huge influence on Impressionist and Post-Impressionist artists. So uh, very famous people like Manet and Monet, Van Gogh, Gauguin, Toulouse-Lautrec, a whole bunch of all of these Impressionist and Post-Impressionist artists. And from there, of course, it then went on to influence um, modern artists like Matisse and Picasso and lots of other people. So this Japanese art um, style is called ukiyo-e. If you've never come across it, um, well, the, the word ukiyo-e, if we translate it, um, it's in three parts. So there's three kanji, three Chinese characters. The first one, uki, is kind of like the idea of floating or rising up to the surface. The second part, yo, is society or public, and also sometimes can be translated as world, not in the sense of the earth, but world as in the world of rich and famous people is so different from the world that I live in, that type of use of the word world. At least that's, you know, from my vague recollections of Japanese language. I used to be a lot more fluent than I am now. So some people will translate then ukiyo-e as floating world pictures. Some people go for an even more poetic interpretation and will say something like transient world pictures. Other, if you're not sure what they are, I don't think that name by itself will help very much to understand the art form. A more practical or more descriptive translation is sometimes uh, Japanese woodblock prints. I think that's much more descriptive and easier to understand what we're talking about. So this style of art, as I said, developed in Japan during the so-called Edo period, over a, a couple of hundred years or so. The Edo period in Japan, prior to that, there had been lots of warfare, lots of civil war in Japan. And Japan was not a united country, it was ruled over by lots of warlords who were constantly fighting with each other uh, until one big battle and one guy came along and basically conquered everybody else and unified Japan into a single country. And he ruled that country from a, a small fishing village, at least at that time it was a small fishing village called Edo. And then Edo became Tokyo. Because people couldn't really travel uh, within Japan, there was restrictions on travel. There was also a lot of people lived in poverty. It was basically a feudal medieval style uh, system. But as the merchant class sort of grew and they got a bit more money, um, they were able to afford luxuries like art. Um, and this ukiyo-e became very, very popular because they focused on things like um, landscapes, famous Japanese landscapes that people could never actually go and see for themselves, but at least they could get a, a print, a picture of this famous like Mount Fuji or something like that. Probably two of the most famous ukiyo-e uh, painters in the West anyway would be Hiroshige and Hokusai. There were kind of four people um, or four groups of people involved in the process of creating these woodblock prints. So the first person was the artist who would go out and do the drawing and sketching and so on. And then the second person was the carver who would carve these images into um, blocks of wood. The blocks of wood, I think, were usually cherry wood, uh, cherry tree. 
because it was very hard and it was very good for taking the sort of little intricate details that the carver could carve into the wood. The next person in the process then was the printer who would take the wooden block and each print could have several blocks because each color required a different block. And they would apply the inks and print everything by hand. And then the final person in the process was more the business side of things, uh, the producer, if you like, who would make sure everybody got paid and take the final prints and sell them to make a profit for themselves. I've included a link to a YouTube video in the description below, which is an old video from Japan. And it, it shows a guy who was one of these ukiyo-e artists back in the 1950s. He was about 73 years old or so when the, the film was made. So he'd been doing ukiyo-e for at least 40 years prior to that. The sound quality is fine. The picture quality is not great on the video, but still, if you're interested in these sort of things, it's, it is an interesting uh, video to watch. So you could say then, okay, we have these Japanese woodblock prints and I'm claiming that they influenced a lot of famous artists, especially impress impressionists and post-impressionists. But how exactly did it influence them? So if you take the example of Vincent van Gogh, which is probably the most um, obvious example of how this Japanese art influenced a Western artist. And you look at Vincent's early paintings, um, a painting like the Potato Eaters, for example. Vincent, when he was, I think it was 27, he decided he wanted to become an artist. And it just so happened that his, one of his cousins was married to an artist whose name I can never remember. I think it was Anton Mauve, maybe. He was a Dutch artist and he painted in that sort of Dutch style. It, it was quite somber, quite dark, lots of earthy colors. And Vincent's early paintings resemble that a lot. Um, they're very dark paintings. When you look at them, they really don't look like uh, Van Gogh paintings in the sort of Van Gogh paintings that most of us associate with Vincent. Very, very dark. And at some point, Vincent went to visit his brother Theo, who lived in Paris. And Theo was an art dealer, or he worked for an art dealer. So he was able to introduce Vincent to lots of this modern art, this impressionism and post-impressionism and things. And you can see the difference, that it, the impression, the difference that it made to Van Gogh. He didn't just like slightly change his art style. His art style changed utterly, completely. Before, as I say, it was all these dark colors and afterwards it was all these pinks and blues and yellows and bright colors. And it was, and he wrote to his brother, Theo, he wrote many letters to his brother, but one of them, he did explain that it was the Japanese art, this ukiyo-e that really made a huge impact on him. And from then he decided to change the sort of color scheme that he was using. And the way, another way in which it may have impacted people like Van Gogh and things, and certainly the way it impacted me was I decided after looking at this Japanese style art, you don't have to produce realistic or photorealistic images in order to produce beautiful images. So the Japanese art wasn't realistic. It wasn't even trying to be realistic. It was lots of flat images, flat areas of color, very vi vibrant colors and lo lots of intricate details as well, or sort of implied details. And those are the ideas that I took and influenced the sort of art that I try to produce. Uh, paintings like this one, for example. And I think it's a useful idea and it's an idea 
it may be useful to other people who are trying to get started with watercolor and find that maybe they're just not making much progress. It's this idea that you don't have to try to produce realistic images. You can create artistic interpretations of the landscape and they can still be beautiful paintings. And you can derive a lot of pleasure from creating these images. So that was basically uh, today's sort of message, if you like, this thing that influenced me and decided, helped me to decide how to take my art, what direction to take it in, away from sort of realism. And for example, I watched a video recently, a guy doing watercolor, and the video was about 30 minutes long. And he was basically talking about how to mix green. And halfway through, I thought this is an incredibly complicated way of thinking about color. It may be necessary, it may be the, the right way of doing it if you're into realism and photorealism and things like that. But from my point of view, if you take some yellow and some blue and mix them together, you get green. Um, it certainly doesn't take a 30 minute video to explain that. So anyway, I'm not trying to put the, those sort of people down or anything. It's just that's their way of looking at art. I just want to try and make people aware that there's another way of looking at art. You don't have to be a photorealist uh, to produce beautiful paintings. Okay, if you made it this far in the video, uh, thank you for watching and hopefully see you in the next one.